the doctrine of total inability. Is it biblical or is it not? And I'm going to allow one of the teachers who are one of the heroes, actually, of many of those who hold this doctrine to define for us what the doctrine of inability is. What exactly is the doctrine of inability? Here is a quote from uh, Dr. John Piper. He says, we need a savior because we are in the morgue, not in the doghouse, you might whimper, or in the doghouse, you might whimper. You might say you are sorry. You might make some good resolutions. You might decide to cast yourself on the mercy of God. But what can you do if you are in the morgue? So here is what they are proposing, is that spiritually, we are completely dead. We are in the morgue, in the words of John Piper. We are in, uh, we have been healed, and we are unable to respond because of our sinful, carnal, human nature. And so what they propose is that man is so corrupted by the fall of Adam that during the fall of Adam, man lost his ability to choose God or to receive God, as I would say. He lost his ability uh, to call on the name of the Lord out of a sincere heart. And God has to do something special in him in order for him to be uh, uh, able to receive the gospel, right? It's, it's again, it's called the doctrine of total inability. What the doctrine of total inability proposes is that because man sinned, all of humanity fell in sin. And of course, certainly we would agree with that. When Adam sinned, all of mankind fell into sin. And therefore, sin, according to scripture, it passed from one person to the next person. It says from Adam to Moses, even those that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. And therefore, sin and death passed upon all men. So it's clear that all men have died because of the fall. All men have fallen short of the glory of God. We agree with that. All men. But what they propose, again, as we're quoting John Piper here, he says this. He says, we are in the morgue, right? It's not that God is mad at us. It's that we're dead. <laughs> You're in the morgue. If you were, if God was just mad at you, then you could perhaps, you know, make up for it. Or you can decide to cast yourself on the mercy of God. But John Piper is, is using the analogy that what can you do if you are in the morgue? This is their definition of being dead spiritually. You are, you, you, you cannot respond. You use, you are basically bound in your sins and you are incapable spiritually because you are spiritually dead to responding to the gospel message, right? So, let me move forward. Here's one of the chief verses that are used by some of my friends, some of my brethren uh, who hold this particular position. Ephesians chapter number two, verse number one, it says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. See, brother Mike, you are dead in your trespasses and sins. And we know that dead men can't respond. If you go to the cemetery, if you go to the funeral home, and you find a person who has deceased or, or gone on, right? And that person won't respond to anything we say or to anything we do. And so they liken that uh, spiritually. They say, and you were dead in your trespasses and in your sins. Therefore, because spiritually you're dead, you are incapable of responding to spiritual things. You can't hear the voice of God because you are dead. You can't respond to the gospel, which is the word, which is spirit, because you are dead. And we're gonna discuss this to see if this is true. Can man respond to God? Is it possible that an unbeliever can hear the gospel truth and actually believe the gospel with, uh, and I'll get into the aid of God just shortly here, but for a, a, a person is so dead that even the gospel itself won't change them 
unless God does something in them first so they can receive the word of God. So that is what they propose. This is what they say. And again, I'm trying to uh, represent the position as best I can. <laughs> All right. And let me move on to the next verse. Now, here's a, a verse that they use. They go to St. John chapter number three, where Jesus answered in verse three, Jesus answered and said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jump down to verse number five. Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So there it is, right? You can't see or enter the kingdom of God until you are first born again. The born again process happens first. Once you are born again, they believe that you can then receive the word. You can then hear and you will hear and acknowledge the truth and then believe and be saved. But born again, being born again means that you have been changed first and after you have been changed then they say you can hear the gospel and respond to the gospel. But prior to that, that person is dead. This is what they hold to. This is what they believe. So born again, being born again is the process that prepares the heart and the mind for the person to receive the gospel and then be saved. Why? Because except the man be born again, can't enter, you can't see the kingdom of God. Okay, well, we're going to discuss these things. We're going to see if this position holds to be true. All right? It's, here, here's the first question. Whenever somebody asks you or tells you something that they say the Bible says, this is absolutely the first thing we have to do. Ask a question. Does the Bible say it? That's, that's question number one, right? Question number one. Now, that doesn't mean that the person may not have uh, some good basis for holding the position that they hold, but the first question, I don't care who they are. I don't care what they say. I don't care how big their name is or how many doctorates or degrees and letters they have attached to their name. I don't care about any of that. You must ask the question. As soon as they tell you what they believe, you have to ask them, does the Bible say it? So here's the question in regards to today's uh, doctrine. Is there any scripture that says man cannot respond to the gospel? Well, I don't care how many texts they try to pull and twist and turn. There is no text that says that man cannot respond to the gospel. Again, that doesn't mean they don't have good basis for believing what they believe. So I want to be fair to the position, but let us do it from the Bible and not our opinions and not the things that we feel or believe or not based on what somebody else told you. What I'm going to do in this presentation today is I'm going to show you what the Bible says, because what the Bible says takes precedence over anything that anybody else says. The Bible is right. Everybody else is wrong. And the case then should be closed. Why? Because the Bible, the scriptures, according to First Timothy, are the inspired, God-breathed word of God. And when the scriptures speak, everybody else should stop talking. So let's let the scriptures talk about it. So the scriptures do not explicitly say that man cannot respond to the gospel. Point number one. So that's established. There's no text that says it. There's no person uh, that can prove or show a verse that says Man can't respond to the gospel message because it's not in the Bible. There's no scripture that says it that must be established. And anybody who would continue to hold that position must be honest enough to admit that although the Bible doesn't say it, you feel it's true. Maybe you feel you still have some good reasons to believe it to be true. Okay, that's fine. But we're going to let the scriptures do the talking on tonight. So there is no scripture that says Man cannot respond 
to the gospel. Absolutely no scripture, period, that says man can't respond to the gospel. Then the question becomes, why do some conclude that man cannot respond? Well, let me help you understand that. Ephesians, I'm going right back to one of the verses they use, and this is one of the chief verses, so I'll be referring to this verse a lot. Ephesians chapter number two, verse number one. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. As a matter of fact, the picture that I have up was sent to me by one who holds that view. He says, this is our condition spiritually. We are in a skeletal position. We can't respond. Can you talk to this skeleton? Can this skeleton get up? Can this skeleton hear? No. So spiritually, what those that would hold the doctrine of total inability will conclude uh, is that because you're dead, you can't hear spiritually. Therefore, you can't hear the voice of God and you can't hear the gospel. All right. You can't hear the voice of God and you can't hear the gospel. This is what they conclude. This is what they tell you. A dead man can't respond. So a dead man must be awakened first by God, by the spirit of God, before he can hear the gospel, and then he can receive. This dead man that you're looking at today, uh, thank you, uh, I don't know who you are, but this skeleton that we're looking at in the picture is a person who have gone to decay. I mean, all the skin is off their bones, right? They can't hear a thing. And this is what some people believe is the condition of our spiritual life. They believe that we're so dead in trespasses and in sins that even the gospel message is unable to reach us except God do something in us first. Because why? You are dead in trespasses and in sins. Well, let's see if what they hold to about being dead is true. Let's see. Let's move right along. All right. The question I would like to pose in this hypothetically at this point, is our spirit dead? That's the question. Our, we, every person uh, would agree that we are three-part beings, right? We are body, we are soul, and we are spirit. We understand that our bodies are the physical part, the flesh, these arms, right? Right? These eyes that need glasses, right? <laughs> right? This, this head that's sweating, <laughs> right? We, this is the physical part, my hands. We are physical, but we are also spirit and soul. So the question I would pose is, did our spirit die when man sinned? Well, the answer is unequivocally no. Your spirit didn't die, per se, because if your spirit actually died, ceased to exist, you would not, <laughs> you would not exist because this body is just a physical shell that houses the inner you that is made up of your soul and your spirit and the spirit which is the life in you so if no spirit ceases to exist guess what you will cease to exist period so our spirits didn't uh take on a literal death because had that happened then all of us would not exist spiritually if, because we are spirit beings in fleshly bodies. I want to make that clear, right? So if our spirits were dead, we would be dead. So the skeleton that they apply to what they would call the spiritual condition, it really does not depict a true application of being dead in sins. Why? Because it's not that the spirit actually died. The spirit is dead in sins, not died, ceased to exist, not died, gone back to the grave, not died as if it has no consciousness. The spirit has consciousness. We all have a spirit that still has consciousness, right? So I want you to understand that. But even in the midst of that, the skeleton is a false application because our spirit mans are still alive. I want to make that clear. Our spirit man is alive from a life standpoint. So let's talk about what happened to the spirits after the fall. Let's keep moving. What does then dead 
in sins, me. Because Ephesians chapter number two said we're dead in trespasses and in sins. Notice Isaiah chapter 59, verse two. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. So I want to make clear, being dead in sins simply means that now there has been a separation between God and man, right? The relationship that man had with God is now severed. The relationship that man had with the creator has now been uh, uh, intervened with. There's, there's been a breakage in that fellowship. And therefore, as a result, that's what it means when some would say that we're spiritually dead. We have been cut off from the life source, which is God. He is spirit. And when our spirits are no longer in relationship with God, then we are in a dead condition, right? And this is what Paul is referring to as he says we are dead in sin. He's not talking about uh, a person in the morgue, as John Piper decided uh, to say, as I showed the quote earlier in the video. No, he's not talking about somebody in the morgue. Your spirit is alive, but it has been separated from God. Therefore, because of our sins, we are dead in trespasses and in sin. We are incapable of getting back to God on our own because we are dead in trespasses and in sin. So it doesn't mean the morgue. It simply means the separation, the cut off. Let's read on. Notice what Isaiah says to a sinful people of Israel. Notice God speaking to Israel. He says, come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. So here God speaking to Israel. Now I want to clarify Israel. They were the chosen people of God, but there were some Israelites that chose not to serve the living God. So although they were the elect people of God, as Isaiah tells us, there were some who chose not to embrace God in the way that God commanded that they should. So not all of them were saved. Not all of them were saved. So here's God now pleading with the children of Israel. God clearly says, come now. Let us reason together, says the Lord. He says, though your sins are scarlet, they will be white as snow. Listen, at the request of God, asking sinful man, let's reason together. In other words, take heed to what I'm saying and understand this. Let's reason. In other words, I don't want to judge you. I don't want the judgment that will come upon every believe, unbeliever rather to fall. God doesn't want judgment to fall on the unbeliever. This is why God is saying, come now, let us reason together. Hmm, God is asking to reason with man. That's what the scripture says. Sinful Israel who had turned her back on God, these individuals were not saved. They were serving the sun God. They were serving the moon's God. They were, they were sacrificing their children on the altar. That's what they were doing. But, but, but God still said, come now, I will wash your sins away. And let me just interject this here, just in case somebody out here uh, needs to know that regardless of the sins that you're committing, God is saying to you, come now, let us reason together, though your sins be as scarlet. God said, I'll make them white as snow. God can forgive you of your sins when we repent. Watch this, verse number 19. And my friends are really going to be upset with this one because they don't believe that God uh, will ask our consent. But Isaiah chapter number one, verse 19 clearly says, if you consent and obey, 
you will eat the best of the land. Look at God telling them, listen, I'm not going to force myself upon you. I'm not going to hypnotize you. I'm not going to uh, uh, change what you got going on in your mind. You have to consent. You have to receive the word of God. You have to allow God to work in your heart and work in your mind. If you're struggling with something, I submit to you, brothers and sisters, that you have to submit to God. Because submit to God in his goodness and his grace and his mercy and allow God to come into your heart. Allow God to cleanse you of your sins. He said, regardless. You could, your sins, listen, I don't care who you are. If you're watching me, your sins are not greater than Israel's sins were here in Isaiah chapter number one. They were burning their, ch their children on the altar, right? And so if God was ready to reason with them and forgive them and wash their sins away, God is still ready and able to wash your sins away if you receive the word, if you consent, if you obey what he's trying to tell you, you will eat the best of the land, all right? Let me move on. So man, according to their doctrine, he's so spiritually dead, and I already showed you the picture of the skeleton. He's so spiritually dead that he can't hear God. God is a spirit. He can't hear the voice of God, right? He can't hear because God has to do something in him first and make him or cause him to believe, cause his mind to be awakened first. But notice here that in Genesis chapter number four, we have a dialogue here between God and Cain. Cain, I don't believe anybody would believe that Cain was saved. Cain was not saved, right? It is evident by the scriptures that Cain was wicked. As a matter of fact, uh, in the New Testament, uh, men like Jude talk about Cain. He was a wicked one, right? He, he was not say right but let's see what the bible says because then if cain isn't saved he's a dead man and dead man can't hear from god dead men can't respond to god dead men are unconscious they are as john piper said in the morgue and if you're in the morgue you can't hear is that true Genesis chapter four would disagree with Mr. Piper and all of my friends that might disagree. It says in verse number six, it says, then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your countenance fallen? Wait a minute. Are you trying to tell me God who is spirit is speaking to a dead man? <laughs> Again, they would say Cain was dead. He can't hear. Oh no, Cain heard the voice of God. Cain heard it. Cain had a conversation with God. God spoke clearly to Cain. That means, guess what? Even before we were saved, God was speaking clearly to us. God was talking to us. And guess what? We heard him talking to us. And I'm not necessarily saying audibly per se, but I'm talking about God was dealing with your heart. He was dealing with your spirit, even in your unsaved condition. God knows he was doing that for me, even in my unsaved condition. And I was lost out. I, I, I was all messed up, but God still spoke to my heart and I heard him. Cain heard him. And notice what God tells Cain. Notice what God tells Cain. God tells Cain, uh, this so-called dead man, if you do well, and Cain hears this, dead in spirit, cemetery, as John Piper says, you're in the morgue, but no, Cain's spirit wasn't in the morgue. Cain's spirit was severed from God, yes, but Cain's spirit was still conscious enough to hear when God spoke. And guess what God said? Cain, if you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? In other words, Cain, I, you, you'll, you'll get your blessing. You'll, you'll get what makes you happy if you, if you do well. Right. Some would say that God is the one that ordained Cain to not do well. That's right? not what the Bible says in no shape, form or fashion. Genesis clearly says God is talking to Cain, saying, if you do well, your countenance will be lifted up. And then God gives him the other alternative to not doing well. And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you. In other words, sin wants to take rule and reign over your life. That goes for each and every one of us, brothers and sisters. Sin wants to rule our lives. Sin wants to take control of our lives. But notice what God said. He says, but you must master it. 
I know many of my reform brothers have fallen out of their chairs right now because this verse says you must master it. What is God saying? That sin does not have to reign over you. We can with God's help. Because guess who, who Cain was hearing from? He was hearing from God. And God made Cain, uh, he, in a sense, he was making Cain a promise. If you do well, you'll be accepted. Your countenance will be lifted. But if you don't do well, sin's going to take control over you. Cain, the decision, though, was not God. It was Cain's. God gave Cain both, both options, right? There's always an alternative option, right? We can either do well or we cannot do well, right? We can either believe God and act on his word, or we can disbelieve God and not act on his word. Otherwise, you would have to believe that God was lying and not being sincere with Cain. God said, if you do well, your countenance will be lifted up. Some of my friends would say there's no way Cain could have done well because he was not chosen. Then you would have to believe that God was playing games with Cain and was not being honest with him. No, this dead man, according to my friends, this dead man heard from God. God gave him two options. On the strength of God's word, we can walk on water, y'all. <laughs> Ask Peter, right? When God's word goes forth, it has the power in it to do what he's telling and calling us to do. Told Cain, if you do well, you will be accepted. Your countenance will be lifted. But if you don't do well, sin is going to take control over you. All right? So let's go back. Ephesians chapter number two, verse one. It says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Let's talk about the word dead. We've already established, and Cain helped us establish that because you're dead doesn't mean you can't hear from God or God can't deal with you. God clearly spoke to Cain. Cain, clear, Cain clearly heard God, right, and gave Cain two options. Cain chose the wrong option, but you don't have to. Just keep listening. So we need to understand what dead is. The Greek word for dead is the word necros. And the word necros, it means unable, ineffective, dead, right? So when we're dead in sins, it means we're unable, ineffective, and dead. Dead to what? Trespasses and in sins. So let's just follow the context. I'm not going to add anything to the text. Let's let the text speak for itself. I am unable to get out of my sins, out of my trust. I am ineffective in all of my efforts to get out of sin. I can't get out of sin on my own. Absolutely no problem. But again, it does not mean that you are so dead that you can't hear from God and God can't deal with you and God can't give you an alternative path to your sins. He did that for Cain. He said, Cain, if you do well, he's doing that for you out there if you don't know the Lord. If you do, if you believe on Jesus Christ, if you repent and turn, God is giving you a way out. He was giving Cain a way out. Cain chose the wrong way. So we have proven, really, that it doesn't mean that we're in the more, as we have stated earlier. And listen, I'm going to help you, because people aren't honest uh, sometimes with the text, right? Because we say dead means you're dead, you're incapable of responding, right? But let's see what else the scripture says, right? The scripture goes on to say, uh, it goes on to say, hold on here, that in Romans chapter 6, verse 11, it says, even so, Consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus, right? They said, consider yourself to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? If we're dead to sin, can we still sin? Because they tell us if we're dead, in sin, we can't respond spiritually. So now that we're dead to sin, how can we then respond to sin? So if we follow their conclusion to its logical end, we would have to conclude that if because we are dead to sin, then we are in the morgue, as John Piper said, we are in the morgue when it comes to sin, 
and sin has no effect on us and we're incapable of responding. Well, I believe there's no one here that will believe that's true. No one here would believe that's true. Why? Because we all would agree that we have seen even after we have come to saving faith. But how can we do that? How can we respond to sin when we're alive to God in Christ Jesus? And sin, uh, dead, simply means necros, unable, ineffective, dead. We can't respond, right? Wrong. It doesn't mean we can't respond. It simply means now that we are saved, Instead of the flesh ruling over us, now the spirit rules over us, and we have to allow the spirit of God to lead us and guide us into all truth. Doesn't mean you can't fall into sin, but what it does mean is that through the help of God, God can help you. Any person out there, God can help you. God can deliver you. God can make a way for you. God can save you. God can restore you. God can give you what you need in order for you to walk in his promises, in his ways. God doesn't and take pleasure, according to the book of Ezekiel, in the death of anyone who dies in their wicked way. God doesn't take pleasure, as some would have you believe, when people die. God doesn't take pleasure when they die in their sins. No, he's grieved in his spirit. Why? Because he's doing, uh, he's done all he can do by sending his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, into the world to die for our sin. So if we're dead to sin, and if dead means you can't respond, that would have to mean that you can't respond to sin. Well, guess what? That makes absolutely no sense. And we know that that can't be the case. Notice, let me give you some, some more Bible. In John chapter number three, right? In John chapter number three, verse 14, verse 15 says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even must the son of man be lifted up. What happened with Israel, this is a quote from Numbers chapter 19, I believe it is. Israel started complaining against God. God had delivered them from Egypt. They started complaining about the bread God gave them from on high, complaining about going back to Egypt, and God got angry with the people. And when God got angry, God sent serpents. The scripture says he sent fiery serpents those fiery serpents began to devour the people of Israel, and, and many of them died. And then some of them ran to Moses and said, wait, Moses, <laughs> we're sorry. They said, please intercede for us. Go to God on our behalf. God, Moses went to God and prayed, said, God, God, spare the people. Moses, the Bible says, interceded for the people. God told Moses, make a, a fiery serpent and lift it up, and those who look to it will be healed of their plague, of the disease that they had through the snake bites. If you look to it, you will be delivered. But they had to look to it. In verse 15, so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. You can have eternal life, brothers and sisters, but you have to look to Jesus. Just like they looked to Moses who held up the serpent in the wilderness and they were saved from the poisonous snake bite. John is telling us if we look to Jesus, whoever believes, this is how we look to Jesus, you gotta believe. Whoever believes will in him have everlasting life. So brothers and sisters, let me break this down for you. The scripture is absolutely clear. Dead, the word necros means incapable of responding and getting out of sin. You still can hear the word of God. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says the word of God makes alive. The word of God is quick and is powerful. It pierces the bone, the joint, the marrow, the spirit, and the soul. When the word of God is preached, man can respond. Cain heard the word of God in his dead condition. We're hearing, we've heard, and this is what we did when we came to save in faith. If you're out there and you don't know Jesus Christ, and I'm gonna go and answer some questions that some might have in just a second, but if you don't know Jesus Christ, all you have to do is look to him, believe upon him as the scripture says. If you believe upon him as the scripture says, you can have eternal life. And there's no one restricted there's no special 
favorite list God has, as some would try to get you to believe. No, that's absolutely not true. We have proven that with the scriptures. But God wants you to come to him in saving faith. God wants you to believe upon him. He's drawing you, right? Even the message right now, right, by way of the Holy Spirit, is drawing those who don't believe, right? And you can respond and say, God, forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my trespasses. I'm sorry. I repent. A sinner, help me, God. Restore me back into the fellowship of your son, Jesus Christ. I believe in Jesus Christ, that he came for me, that he died for me, that he was buried and rose on the third day. I trust in his word and what he did for me. In his shed blood, I trust in it. Put your faith and confidence in it. And God says, you shall be saved. That's a promise God made that he will not break. So let me help you understand, though we are dead in trespasses and in sins prior to coming to Christ, the doctrine of inability is false because they make a false application. Your spirit didn't die. You died from your relationship with God. It was severed, but you're alive and God still deals and works with your spirit. He did that with Israel, He did that with Cain, he did that with me. And I believe he's done that with many of my brothers and sisters who are watching. And I believe if you're not saved, he's doing that with you by way of this video. And all you have to do is repent, call upon the name of the Lord, right? And you shall be saved. You want more information about that, please inbox me, reach out to me. We can make sure you get to a Bible-believing church and be taught the word of God. But there is no exclusive list. There is no God doesn't want these people saved, so he's keeping them in the dark. Right. God isn't setting some people aside, not allowing them to believe. See, this is what the doctrine of inability uh, uh, says. God didn't want to save them. Right. But but everybody who believes that God wanted to save them. What a coincidence. Oh, he wanted to save you. I call it the just us doctrine. Just us theology. Just us salvation. God died, Jesus Christ died, but just for us. <laughs> and we should just be grateful that he included us. Who cares? Maybe not my kids. Maybe, maybe my children aren't elect. But I'm one of the ones. So I'm good. He died just for us. Listen, brothers and sisters, that is the most ridiculous teaching one of the most ridiculous teaching ever introduced to church history. Christ has shed his blood and tasted death for every man. Hebrews chapter number two, read it. And if you believe on Jesus Christ, you are not incapable. You are not incapable of receiving the truth. You are not incapable of receiving the gospel. You can repent and believe the gospel and so God will save you once you hear. But you can also reject. But in the day you hear his voice, and I trust you hear his voice tonight, harden not your heart. Don't turn away. Jesus told Jerusalem, he said, oh, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered your children as a hen does her chicklings? He says, but you were not willing. You have to be willing and obedient, Isaiah chapter number one, and you will eat the fruit of the land. If you consent, if you give in, if you receive, listen, we all fought against the gospel message, no doubt. We all fought against the leading of the Holy Spirit. We all fought against that. But, but, but one day you made a conscious decision when God's spirit, because of his mercy, continue to work on you. You decided to allow God into your heart and you believed on him according to the scriptures and God saved you, right? And if you're not saved, you can have that same experience. If you believe on Jesus Christ, right? You believe that he died. You believe that he was buried. You believe that he rose again. The scripture says that whosoever, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter what your position is. It doesn't matter how much money you have. Whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It doesn't matter. God doesn't have an exclusive list. He doesn't have a favorite list. He loves you. And if you're watching me, I don't have no uh, mints about these words. God loves you. And if you repent and believe on his son, Jesus Christ, God promised that he'll bring you into the fellowship, fill you with his spirit. And by one spirit, we are all baptized into the body of Christ. You can be saved tonight, brothers and sisters, if you trust in Jesus Christ. There is no doctrine of inability. It is false. It should be preached against because those that preach it 
think that God just loved them and don't love nobody else, just us. Listen, you are wrong, and that's a foolish, prideful thing to say. No, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish. You don't have to die, but have everlasting life. That is the gospel. That's what we should be preaching and teaching in all of our churches, and we need to stop with the foolishness that God just wants us.